probably one of the most visible changes, quite frankly, is the, the explosion, the mushrooming, uh, the growth in the number of people in need of urgent assistance. Um, the global humanitarian overview that's a joint appeal coordinated by the United Nations together with partners, the Food and Agriculture Organization is part of it, launched at the end of last year an appeal to support some 230 million people. I mean, these numbers, quite frankly, are eye-watering. Um, and it tells us that we need to do not just more, but we need to do it better. There's a number of key lessons, but I'd like to focus on the resilience that exists at the household level and in communities and the remarkable ability of people even in the most extreme disaster situations to cope, to survive, to adapt. For us as FAO, uh, a key message that we want to share with everyone and that we need to share with everyone is the fact that the vast majority of people in need of humanitarian assistance are to be found in rural areas. These are farmers, these are people who are attached to the land or their fisher folk, right? And so that's the starting point we need for our emergency response. Fundamentally, it's about putting resources in the hands of uh, affected farming families. This means, for example, uh, seeds, tools, technical assistance to allow them to plant for a coming season. It means keeping animals alive during a drought period or during a winter, and we do that through provision of emergency animal feed, um, even medical assistance, veterinary assistance to animals to keep these precious assets alive. Um, often it's also about just putting cash in the hands of people. I mean, these activities together are usually what people need to get through a difficult period when we're talking about farming families. For example, I was just in Afghanistan uh, just over a month ago. Just last year alone, FAO, uh, with some 21 implementing partners, directly supported more than 6 million Afghans. 6 million rural Afghans with time-sensitive intervention. So we've been keeping animals alive through the winter season. We provide cash support to female-headed households, uh, marginalized families that even don't have access to a lot of land. FAO was pivotal in successfully leading in support of a number of governments, which was preventing, responding to and preventing this major desert locust outbreak that hit much of uh, the Horn of Africa, Eastern Africa, uh, and indeed uh, beyond. And early detection, treatment, uh, allows us to respond, allowed us to respond uh, at scale. This was a response over two years that cost $230 million. It saved at least $1.8 billion in crop losses. Makes sense. Why wait until the disaster happens before you respond? From a human dignity perspective, who wouldn't rather be able to protect themselves, their families, rather than have to wait for a handout or wait for assistance after a disaster took place? FAO's strength in humanitarian response comes from its development background. We are grounded in communities and countries. We have long-standing relationships over decades with ministries of agriculture. If we distribute seed in a country, we know it's the right seed because we've been improving it over years. People in food crisis contact, more than 70% of them live in rural communities. These farmers are fisher folk. And yet only 4% of all of the humanitarian response funding that goes into those protracted emergency settings supports agriculture, right? So you have a majority of the population relying on farming and a minority of the funding to support agricultural response uh, activities. And this just simply doesn't make sense. So this attention to livelihoods and emergencies is absolutely indispensable. It's a cost-effective way to respond. It's a dignified way uh, to support uh, individuals affected by disasters. Not only do we provide that a means for families to eat in the weeks and months ahead, we strengthen their resilience against uh, future disasters. We also, as FAO, respond after 
what we call sudden onset events after a for example, the tragedy that we've seen now of the earthquake in Turkey that's impacting both Turkey and Syria. This is also part of what we do and it needs a time sensitive response. But the majority of what FAO does in emergency response is actually year on year crisis response. This is where we need to be working and this is where we need to work differently. FAO is already uh, planning uh, and supporting members in the preparations um, to respond to the potential impacts of uh, an El Nino phenomenon. So it's not yet clear uh, and confirmed that there will in fact be an El Nino later in the year, but the probabilities are growing. And we know through hard-won experience how this then manifests itself in different parts of the world. And so again, from an anticipatory perspective, we're already working ahead with partners and with governments to make sure that vulnerable communities are best placed to withstand these impacts. FAO and other partners in the UN system back in late uh, 2021 were uh, calling for a scaled up response because we saw that rains were failing and indeed that communities and vulnerable households were, uh, were under stress. Unfortunately, what we're seeing in the Horn of Africa is an example of early warning analysis and anticipatory action calls going really unheeded. Somalia is a really good example of where a time-sensitive agricultural intervention would enable a family to have to, to be able to stay on their land, to not be forced to displace to a, a camp outside of an urban setting. Our experience in Somalia and elsewhere tells us that if people's animals are still alive, if they have crops in the ground, if they've been able to plant seeds, if there are things to tend, more often than not, they will not be forced to flee uh, elsewhere. And so this is the most uh, effective and most dignified response that we can possibly mount. This is a region made up of multiple countries with different zones, but again, uh, these fundamental lessons about supporting farming households where they are, supporting pastoralists with the type of support they need. Adequate attention to livestock, for example, is not something that's really in focus in the way that it should be in collective humanitarian responses. FAO is a technical agency uh, with a unique mandate within the the UN system and the way we work in conflict settings is grounded in our technical expertise. Let me give an example from um, Tigray. Uh, so this last year there was a lot of concern about uh, the threat of uh, famine. FAO of course was working in Tigray and working across Ethiopia um, before uh, the conflict uh, and the fighting erupted and in a context where there was conflict unfolding people were still able to grow. Farmers in Tigray, with support from FAO and others, produced 900,000 metric tons of food. So equivalent to six to seven months of the food requirements of that uh, region. I think there are some really important lessons collectively that I hope we've learned uh, when it comes to the reality of the interface between humans and animals and the natural uh, environment. These diseases that can move between animals uh, and humans can challenge food chains, but can also potentially um, uh, impact humans directly as well. FAO works day in and day out uh, with other parts of the UN system and other partners on this uh, space of animal health. In the last 12 months, uh, FAO prevented and responded to some 990 significant outbreaks of um, uh, zoonosis. If you didn't hear much about it, it's because FAO did a good job, right? This prevention of uh, the next COVID, uh, I think is, uh, is really, really important. We're very focused on famine uh, prevention at the moment. Um, and the work that we do as FAO uh, plays an absolutely indispensable role within the famine prevention space. So this isn't just about a handout, this is about doing something 
much more impactful.